Welcome everybody out to this episode of the TVCRE podcast. My name is Taylor Tibbetts here with co-host Drake Campbell. Excited to be here today with our guest Corey Chekets. Um, Corey's a, a friend and a, a, a guru when it comes to um, affordable housing and excited to listen to him today. Um, he um, owns and operates um, a couple of different companies. Um, Happy Home Capital Corporation, a uh, nonprofit company, yep. as well as Aleph Tov mm -hmm. um, Incorporated, yep. and S Corp. And uh, we'll have you kind of break that down sure. for us as we get into the show. But yeah, welcome. Absolutely. Yeah, glad to have you today. Thanks for being here. Yeah, it was an honor to be invited. Um, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to, to come on here and have a conversation. We do want to give one disclaimer. Everything we're saying is legitimately composed by ourselves, not chat GPT. So we were talking about chat GPT a little bit. If you don't know about it, you will soon. So <laughs> this, this is, is authentic. This is, all this is us. Yeah. real life action commentary right now. Right. So this is exciting. So thank you for coming on our yeah, show. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so, yeah, like you had told us, um, starting out before we were starting yeah. recording, uh, the Aleph Tav, can you kind of talk a little bit about yeah. how that name came to be and then maybe kind of about how you got into this industry? Yeah, absolutely, that's a great question. Um, so Aleph Tov is a S Corp I founded about a little over a year ago. And it's the, Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet and Tov is the, the last letter. Um, so there's a little bit of those connotations of alpha and omega mm -hmm. um, built into that uh, beginning and end, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's at the top of, of sort of the corporate hierarchy for, for my organization that my wife and I own. Um, and then I have some subsidiary entities, LLCs that are, you know, wholly owned by the uh, S Corp that mm -hmm. do different features, you know, operations to consulting to individual ones for owning and acquiring assets and that kind of thing. Um, in terms of the second part of your question of sort of how I got started with this, um, I guess I could go back to the beginning. Um, yeah, where were you? Maybe yeah. were you from around here? I didn't yeah, know that. yeah, like, no, that's fair. How so, that start? so I was born in the St. Luke's in downtown Boise. Okay. Um, grew up out in Cuna. Went to Cuna School District from K through twelve. The cavemen. Yeah, Cuna cavemen. Oh, oh. Um, that's right. Yeah. So, and I know I have a connection there with 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 Taylor. Um, or yeah, having you live in Cuna. Yeah, live in Cuna. My so. kids go to school out in Cuna, and we're cavemen. Yeah. 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 So, and then when I graduated high school, I wanted to get away from Idaho. Yeah. Um, feel like now that I moved back, that was misguided, but you know, here we are. Um, <laughs> I feel like everybody who's been raised here kind of has to go through that. Like, yeah. I need to get out of here. This place feels small and there's nothing to do, but. Yeah. But it's magic. It, I mean, it's magical. And I know you've shared that, mm -hmm. you know, on previous episodes that just there's a charm about Idaho and particularly yeah. the Treasure Valley. Um, so, yeah, I moved away to school. I went to the University of Maryland outside of D.C. Um, for undergrad. And then my plan had been to either become an attorney or to go to grad school. And I wanted to either go pursue um, being like an ethicist. Mm -hmm. So either teaching philosophy or working at a hospital or something like that. But um, at the time, um, it just didn't pencil out and I didn't want to take on debt to go to grad school. And so I decided to move back here mm -hmm. and then. In terms of how I got into real estate and particularly affordable housing, um, I merely answered a Craigslist ad, which I don't know if people even <laughs> still use that anymore. Yeah. On occasion, uh, I hear about it, but not much, right? Dude, I did a PBS documentary because I answered a Craigslist ad. See, there you so, go. Yeah, yeah. One of the coolest experiences <laughs> of my life. Yeah. Um, so by complete fate, just I fell into an entry level job working for Thomas Development Company, um, and its principal is Tom Mantrek, who's known in the affordable um, mm -hmm. housing space, um, and in Boise in general, mm -hmm. um, quite well. Um, and I cut my teeth with him um, for about two and a half, three years. And the first week I was there, he said, we're applying for these federal tax credits in a month, figure it out, I'm here to help. And uh, <laughs> You know, it wasn't just that. Obviously, I had a yeah. lot of help, and I don't want to take the credit for it because I didn't really know what I was doing. And I'd say if you get into this space, it probably takes you a year to even understand what's going on and probably another five years to really get yeah, the right. ins and outs. Of, just the terminology alone, yeah, probably. Yeah, you're learning, policy. you're learning a completely new language, and mm -hmm. you're working with federal, state, and local governments, and each of them have their own acronyms. And even the federal programs, they don't always you know, mesh well together. And so did about five or six deals working under Tom's leadership and 
um, and then parted ways there in 2014. Um, went to a competitor, Community Development Incorporated, in 2014. Worked with uh, the principal there, Fred Cornforth, and at the time, Bill Truax, who's now gone on and started Galena Fund in Boise, mm -hmm. was a mentor to me there. And so mm -hmm. he was there until 2016, so we had some overlap. And, um, and then, like I mentioned, sort of at the onset in 2021, I've branched off and formed my own company. Yeah. And I still have a great relationship with CDI um, and consult for them on a regular basis. Um, and we can get into more on that in a minute. But yeah. that's kind of the history. But, yeah, it was a complete random, you know, thing. Just answering a Craigslist ad, not sure the direction that God or life was going to take me. And, and here we are on a podcast. That's wonderful. Yeah. I love it. That's so. wonderful. And with some really good mentors along the way, it sounds like you've had That's, some incredible yeah. shaping experiences. Yeah. And I know I, I'm like forgetting people, but mm -hmm. between Tom Mantrak, Fred Cornforth, Jim Tomlinson even, mm -hmm. um, and then on the legal side, working with people like Brad Britzman, who handles a lot of uh, transactions for on the LIHTC space, low income housing tax credit space. Yeah, I've had, and Bill Truex, I've had tremendous, you know, mentors along the way. Yeah, so maybe, said it kind of quickly, LIHTC is Low, low Income it, yeah, Housing sorry. Tax Credits, L-I-H-T-C. Yeah. And you'll see that on a lot of projects that that are being developed, right? You'll see people mm -hmm. proposing this is going to be a LIHTC project. Yeah. Like, Boise Dev will say something about it. So yes. for our viewers, it's good to know what that actually means. And yeah. Maybe you could say, what does that actually mean? Like, yeah. what is a low-income housing tax credit? Well, you could start by looking up Section 42 of the Internal Revenue Code. Um, it's a pretty es esoteric document, but it's not that long. Um, <laughs> and basically, in the Reagan era, in the 1986 tax reform, they passed uh, this section of the Internal Revenue Code. And the basic functions of it are um, in exchange for um, federal tax credits that an owner of a project can claim on their federal tax returns, um, you have to agree to construct and operate a apartment complex with rent and income restrictions for the resident base. And there's a whole you know, literature on the compliance requirements for qualifying residents mm -hmm. to meet that. And then all of that legally is evidenced on title mm -hmm. with a deed restriction mm -hmm. that's recorded at closing. Um, and so what's really cool about the program, at least from a political thing, and I know this isn't a political podcast, but generally speaking, both, both sides of the aisle tend to like this program because mm -hmm. on the, on the right, you know, on the right wing side, it's offering a federal tax credit to offset tax revenue, and it'll incentivizes private investment into what people on the left are all, and both parties are concerned with, but the social good of providing mm -hmm. affordable housing mm -hmm. for residents. Um, and so you get a public-private partnership where you have private firms that want to offset their tax liability investing money into yeah. a particular project. So one of those rare things that unites the aisles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, it has, and it's arguably, you know, at least in my humble opinion, it's been the most successful, um, affordable housing type program, you know, in existence, um, and has resulted in quite a, quite a few units being developed. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely been challenging to learn, but it's a really rewarding space to, to operate in. So I know I'm going to ask all these questions. Sorry, sure. but, so away. you begin, you spend a couple of years learning the, the genre, I would sure. say, of this area. You're mentoring. What were some conceptions that maybe that you've had in the beginning that have changed as you've gone along? And mm. um, what are some of the key factors I would say you've learned about it that you would say the general public is unaware of? And maybe those are the same yeah. question. but Yeah, that's... Like, I, I just feel like... There might be bias. Would well, you there's use that definitely word, a not in my backyard oh, problem, sure. right? A maybe sure, yeah. problem whenever you <clears throat> propose a low-income housing project in a neighborhood, yeah. right? Um, but I'm wondering if there's things you learned that you came in and you're like, wow, I kind of had this conception of this when I started, and this has changed as we've gone farther down the rabbit hole. Yeah, that's a fair question. You know, a lot of the feedback, it goes to that nature of not in my backyard, mm -hmm. um, especially when you have to go to cities for entitlements. And, you know, usually in my experience... Um, you know, municipalities and staff people are usually very supportive, very on board, but there's definitely public perceptions 
um, you know, I've heard comments of this is social engineering or, you know, I just, I don't want the traffic or I don't want mm -hmm. those people, you know, living in my backyard, whatever that might mean. Um, one of the biggest misconceptions is, is although the program's called low income housing tax credit, if you were to look at Boise, someone that would qualify under the program, a family of four could be making 60,000 a year, mm -hmm. you know, and qualify to live in one of these units. That could be an entry level person working at, you know, a city or a title company or yeah, right. anywhere, yep. you know, and, and those people would qualify at, at a 60% AMI level. Yep. Um, and so that was a big misconception that I'd had is that I think sometimes people will conflate section 42 by tech deals with section eight, which mm -hmm. might be more tailored for the very low income. And there can be overlap between the two programs. You can, you know, combine them. Um, but that, that would be one. Um, I think the other one is, you know, when, when someone's 20 years old and they're setting out, you think you know everything, you know, and mm -hmm. you're correct and you're never wrong and you know the world and you can do things better. And I think just part of just everyone's life journey is, is just, you know, eating a slice of humble pie every day. <laughs> um, and so for me, learning, making mistakes, um, every deal's unique, every deal's going to have its own challenges you know for example one that cdi um, had developed i actually with some partners acquired it last year um, and that one is located in anaconda montana for example and the whole city is a epa superfund site basically oh interesting and mm. so that's something that's unique to that site yeah. that you know as you're going into the deal you might not have a background into what is an epa superfund mm -hmm. site what is envi what are environmental conditions that would uh, you know affect a property and so each each property each town each community has its own story and in that particular project for example when that one was developed they had to come in and scrape out 20 feet of topsoil because it was contaminated with arsenic and you know all kinds of stuff from the smeltering that was going on if you've ever been to anaconda you drive in and there's a 2000 foot smokestacks mm -hmm. just standing out of a mountain beautiful beautiful part the of beautiful the beautiful valley world, in montana yeah. yeah so yeah it's funny how you kind of discover these things as you go i just did a deal yeah. downtown boise with it was a former electroplating facility okay. yeah and then learning about the different types of metal contaminations that could have been there on the property and what the remediation does but yeah once you're in those deals your eyes are opened up and the education happens yeah. pretty quickly yeah and you probably have dealt with under underground oil plumes yep. especially in like downtown boise and yep. nampa and caldwell where you have these gas and oil petroleum plumes underground and mm -hmm. learning about the importance of being up gradient or down gradient and you know it's it's a big deal we we uh closed on a refinance I consulted with for Community Development Incorporated up in Fairbanks. And that one was adjacent to a dry cleaner that had yep. been contaminating the ground yep. and it was down gradient. And, wow. Picked all you know, that up. fortunately when the project was built, it was built, you know, with um, a vapor barrier and we had to test, you know, for vapor intrusion and all of that when we were going through this refinance and everything was fine. But, but yeah, you never know what could be going on. So, so walk us through, can you walk us through the process of like, somebody has an idea, they want yeah. to build a project. They say, Hey, our desire is to help people or our desire is to benefit the investors either way. And so how does the process go from a thought yeah. into a project? Yeah, that's, I really like how you framed that because, um, you know, one of the deals that I was involved with, I remember standing there at the ribbon cutting, seeing children playing in the parking lots and mm -hmm. thinking, this started out as just an idea, not mm -hmm. even not even this site being known, just that this was going to materialize and just manifest. And, um, you know, I think what you do is you pay attention to the the funding cycles that they that go on in each state. And so for Idaho, for example, the low, low income housing tax credit program, and this is true of the other states, just the agencies might be different, but the authority is vested in the governor for each state to administrate okay. the program for treasury and the IRS. And in Idaho, they appointed Idaho housing and finance, um, agency, or is it authority association? Sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, in, in Idaho, they appointed it to IHFA, mm -hmm. which is a quasi governmental body. I, I'm not an attorney, so 
Taylor probably knows more about what that means legally, but... Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a mixed bag. <laughs> but anyways, the board, I believe, is appointed by the governor, and the mm -hmm. governor ends up signing off on their administrative plan every year. Mm -hmm. And so in most of these states, they run their funding cycle on an annual cyclical basis. Mm -hmm. And so each year, Treasury and the IRS gives the states a per capita amount of credits. And okay. Typically, it's been between 225, and I think they've adjusted it up for inflation. I think we're now at like three dollars uh, per capita in, in annual tax okay. credits or something. Every so, year. Yes, it's every year. year. Um, Are there any carryover? Uh, yeah, the, I, and that's that's a better question for the people Sorry, who administrated I'm, at IHFA. But yeah. I believe they have some discretion on on okay. carrying it forward and, and applying it to past mm. deals. And basically, they have to allocate it within a certain time period, which means they have to reserve it to certain proposals. And then they have so many, so much time until they can materialize it. And it's it's evidenced with the submission of a form called uh, 8609. Mm -hmm. um, and that's an IRS form that's submitted on what's on a per building identification number. And so you would think, you know, intuitively, you would think, oh, that just means different buildings. In fact, it could be even more complicated than that. You could do it by floors. You could even do it by oh, segments within the building. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because some people will offer, like, uh, we'll give this many units that are low-income housing, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and so sometimes in, in bigger bigger markets, you might have a condominiumized high-rise building that mm -hmm. has X number of floors dedicated to the tax credit units and the rest to, you know, market rate or that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So anyways, you find out what the cycle is within the state housing agency. And in Idaho, for example, it, the application rounds are due every August. Um, and so you basically follow that track and then you try to find your site and your market and all that ahead mm -hmm. of that. Um, IHFA has several threshold items that you have to have for your pr proposal. Site control is one of them. That could be, you know, owning the land, being under contract, mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing. And then Idaho wants the site. And there's probably valid reasons for it in the history of the program of why I Idaho housing has developed it this way. Um, they typically want it to be fully entitled, um, oh, or at least in terms of zoning, yeah. um, you know, maybe yeah. not utilities, but you know, they definitely want the zoning. And my suspicion is, is that they've had projects that they gave yeah. the green light to, and then they didn't have it and and in the community the, because of the yeah. NIMBYism situation that we discussed, you know, had some backlash and, yeah. you know, they had to then find someone else to do it. Um, and so, yeah, so for um, some of the projects that I've been more involved with on the site selection and stuff, you know, just finding a market, um, and then ultimately understanding the funding cycle and the funding mechanism within IHFA has really driven for me sort of where deals are looking at. Um, Tom Mantrek would used to joke um, that, you know, the development community are like cows fo following the hay truck, you know? So if, <laughs> if IHFA is setting the guidelines, we're just gonna follow the direction yeah, that yeah, they're going. Of and the, the mechanism in which we do that is their scoring. So they weight the proposals based on a selection criteria. And some of them are dictated from the Tax Reform Act that was passed in the 80s that they have to weigh projects on certain categories. Um, for example, um, they have to give weight to projects located in a qualified census tract. Um, that's part, and that's part of a community revitalization plan of the mm. local municipality. Now, where the states have leeway or discretion is how they rank those competing priorities. Mm -hmm. And so the biggest thing for me is um, because there's a per capita limitation on the credits, you're competing with, you know, a bunch of other developers for a limited finite resource. Yeah. And so you have to get above the scoring threshold mm -hmm. because you're taking on a lot of risk and overhead and time to submit a proposal. Yeah. Um, and you know, just on a pure cost basis, a proposal is probably going to cost 25 to 50 grand to submit. Mm -hmm. And so you really want to know that, you know, you want to aim for 80% or you want to, yeah, shot. yeah. Mm -hmm. And nothing's guaranteed in life and you have to be willing to take risks, but you don't want to go in on something not knowing, you know, if you're going to be successful or not. And so to me, to answer that part of your question, I know this has been a long answer, but you really got to understand what's driving the scoring. You got to understand. Mm -hmm. um, it's like a rubric. 
Yeah, it yeah. really is. It's it's uh, it's like the old I don't know. It's like an alchemy joke or whatever. But it's like squaring the circle, you know, mm -hmm. where you really have to like try to fit that circle in the square um, and map up these different priorities. And then if you're working with local municipalities, they might have different time frames yeah. and stuff. If they have CDBG community development block yep. grant money, or if you're working with um, also with IHFA on their home investment partnership program grant money. Um, yeah, because typically, I'm, I'm going to assume if someone's savvy enough to go after LIHTC, they're going to also probably try to stack incentives as much as they can. Yeah, yes and no. It's a trade-off, right? <laughs> so like with each layer, you're going to have different additional reporting requirements. And at a certain point, the layer of complexity might make it too mm. difficult because you yeah. also got to think about the back end of this too, which is, and as someone that has gone through a refinance that has involved you know, a capital stack that had like five different subordinate loans mm. and trying to do a, a HUD 223F refi, which is a section 223F um, under the HUD program where they basically dictate how you're going to structure the loan and then sell the mortgage backed securities. And, and then anyways, um, you know, having all those subordinate loans, it can make it more complicated, you know, mm -hmm. for the people that you're working with too, or prospective buyers down the road. So yeah, but you're right. I mean, generally speaking, um, if you are going to go into the level of sophistication on the tax credit side, you may end up having some additional federal state, or, you know, monies involved. Um, can you so break... Sorry, do you mind if I jump in? Can you break down the incentive for investors in a yeah. light tech deal? Yeah, exactly. for sure, yeah, for good. sure. Um, so if you're an investor in a light tech deal, it's typically, most commonly the investors are institutions. So whether mm -hmm. it's banks or insurance companies, those are typically the end users. Um, on a state level, sometimes you can have high net worth individuals. Um, a lot of states, Idaho is not one of them, but a lot of states have also implemented uh, a state tax credit program okay. that's supposed to mirror mm. the, federal the federal one. Um, and several states have implemented something like that. And in those cases, you might find more localized high net worth individuals in those states. But generally speaking, the investors are institutional um, organizations. And so the benefit for them is, is that by means of being an owner in the entity that owns the assets, so being an owner, the tax credits flow via ownership interest in okay. the apartment complexes. And so with the way that the, um, in a lot of ways, you're basically as an investor, you're investing in losses. So it's mm -hmm. an inverse sort of niche industry that's the complete opposite from the investor standpoint from what mm -hmm. you might tr traditionally look at. So you got to have gains for yes, it to make sense. Exactly. And so, which is it, why it's corporations probably. Yeah. And so it was, you know, it's kind of dark, but you know, during the recession there, the, the whole tax credit market drew, um, dried up so because everyone, everyone already had all their losses that they needed. And so what happened during those years was treasury bought the credits mm. directly. So in the Obama administration, they basically authorized treasury to buy up all the credits. Interesting. Um, and so those deals that were funded from 2010 until probably 2013, the vast majority of them were financed with direct investment from treasury. So, wow. hmm. so in addition to getting the credits, which I can go into how credits are calculated, um, and that's a different, that's a different you know, corollary to all this, um, they're also getting the rights to losses and depreciation. Yeah. And by nature of the, the apartment complex having rent, rent and income restrictions, net operating income on a tax, on a tax basis is going to be at a loss every year because okay. depreciation is going to exceed the, the income that the property is going to generate because the rents are restricted. Mm -hmm. And so the investors are buying the rights to those losses and tax credits. And you get the credits um, over a 10 year period. And so the investors will get K1s from their involvement in the owner entity, and they'll file an 8609 form A um, with your tax return. The K1s will show the net losses and then they, they flow up to, okay. the, to the end user. Um, now, I mentioned how credits are calculated. So the credits are calculated um, as a per present value percentage of um, depreciable assets. Okay. So if you if you build an apartment complex that's worth say a million dollars, the building value is a million, then you would get credits based on that million dollar valuation multiplied by the applicable federal rate, which is supposed to translate that value to a seventy percent present value, roughly. Mm -hmm. um, 
So you would multiply it and they've fixed the percentage by law in, in the last 10 years at different times um, and renewed it. But basically there's two types of low income housing tax credits you can get. There's the 9% credit, which is associated with a 70% present value. And there's the 4% credit, which is associated with a 30% present value. Okay. And so you'd take that million, you'd multiply it by 9%. That mm -hmm. would get you your annual credits. And then you get that over 10 years. So you'd multiply that by 10. And that's the amount of credits. The investor is going to enter into a amended and restated partnership mm -hmm. agreement that's, you know, you know this, this thick. And <laughs> it's got every provision under the sun. Um, no, I'm joking. But... Um, and they are going to agree to capital contributions at present value, you know, mm. present value of their losses, present value of their tax credit benefits. And then they're going to bake into it expected yield on their investment, mm -hmm. you know, but it's not really in the sense that we're accustomed to, you know, in mm -hmm. tr traditional real estate deals, the yield is the loss return, mm -hmm. you know, that they're going to get. It's um, really interesting. Yeah. Is there cash flow still? Yes. But typically the investors in the deal aren't concerned with that mm -hmm. they will have a portion of cash flow come to them but that's mo only mostly to cover their overhead costs associated with compliance monitoring oh, okay mm -hmm. the general partner sponsor is the one that's getting the majority of the, the, upside cash, of the cash flow, flow. Yeah. which so the... isn't a lot but yeah. um you know you might have a 30 unit project you might be you might be lucky if it depending you know if everything goes well and um you know you you underwrite it conservatively you might be getting twenty thousand a year out of it okay. you know so it's it's a smaller you know it's a smaller project and part of that's because the state agencies are tasked with making sure they're being efficient with the credits that yeah, they don't yeah. over allocate it to a particular project and so that incentivizes you know leveraging up and Oftentimes, you'll see these deals coupled with Fannie or Freddie mm -hmm. Mac executions on yep. debt, and they have, you know, I would, I don't want to say looser because that has a kind of a bad connotation, but they'll allow you to go up higher on your LTV constraint. They'll mm -hmm. allow you to go lower on your debt service coverage ratio, and so the deals are have higher leverage on that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so as a result, that also compresses the your cash, cash flow. flow. Of yeah. yep. So the way you, now you could ask after I've said that, you could say, well, why would you do this? You know, why would someone <laughs> yeah. I mean, do I was going to ask it in some form. <laughs> like, why would you, I mean, maybe I'm a glutton for punishment. No, but a know, lot of people do it though. I mean, it's yeah. Like, and, and I was going to, I was going to mention, and now is as good a time as any, I, when I first started out in this industry, going back to your earlier question, one of the things that I learned that I really surprised me is the number of just like first class developers that we've have in Boise. It's kind of an enclave of it between Tom Mantrek, who I mentioned, Jim Tomlinson, mm -hmm. Fred Cornforth, Caleb Roop, mm -hmm. um, all of them operate in this space. And I know I'm leaving out other firms that deserve mention, but I was really surprised to see that you have multi-state sort of some semi-national developers all based out of Boise. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's something in the water or what, but there's a sort of entrepreneurial spirit yeah, here. Um, but to answer that question that we posed of why would you get into it, the sponsor and the developer are typically one and the same on these deals. So the sponsor is going to be the one submitting the application and they're typically the developer. They'll enter into a development agreement with the proposed owner, which will be an LLC or limited mm -hmm. partnership. And then they'll get a developer fee and, and that's restricted. IHFA regulates that, mm -hmm. but it's, uh, it's basically 15% of that depreciation depreciation cost basis okay um not counting that developer fee so right. you extract that out you know whatever that number is multiplied by 15 percent. got it um it's it's lower if you have higher unit deals um they'll restrict it down um i'm not going to comment on the thought process behind that but in any event maybe it's economies of scale or something mm -hmm. but Typically, states will allow you to get between 10 and 15 percent of, okay. of, of the cost basis as a developer fee. So you get something up front, you get some compressed cash flow, mm -hmm. and then at the end of the deal, and it depends really if it's a for-profit or non-profit involvement, but at the end of the 15-year period, although the credits are claimed over 10 years, you have a 15-year compliance period, so mm -hmm. they're earned over 15, um, and then you have a couple years 
for look back for the IRS, whatever that might be, mm -hmm. is it seven years per audit um, or for tax return. So you have a time period where, you know, your 15 year period's over and then obviously the IRS could come back and look mm -hmm. at your, your uh, tax return and potentially find issue with it. But um, once at, that's cleared, once that's clear, once you hit year 15, um, you'll start to have some real heart to heart or coming to Jesus talks with your investors about the exit plan. And one of the things that I've learned that I didn't understand up front when I first got in this is just how important it is whenever you're setting out with any business invent, uh, uh, venture is to really understand the exit strategy up front. Always. Mm -hmm. um, Typically, what you'll see is a negotiation with the, the limited partners where the general partner and sponsor will get 90% and the, the investor will get 10% on a sale. Um, and so there's ways in which that can go wrong and, and all that, but typically that's the sort of goal that the industry has tried to set um, is the sponsor will get 90%. It could be 80%. And all that can go into how you price out the capital contributions. Maybe but, depend on how it's leveraged. Yeah, too. that too. Um, and so, so talk about delayed gratification, but that sounds like a huge win once you get there. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Um, for sure. Because if an area like Boise has appreciated for 20 years, mm -hmm. then you get to a point where you're able to now cash in 90% of that deal. Yeah, and, and, and since the <clears> rents, <throat> and I didn't go into this, but since the rents are based on what I referred to as AMI, that stands for area medium income. Mm -hmm. And so as Boise's grown, mm -hmm. we've seen a substantial growth in area medium income. Mm -hmm. And so deals that were placed in service 15 years ago yeah. before the growth that's taken place so in the saying, last fight. Like, yeah. So the what about the what about the low income aspect of it when it sells? Is it no long is it back to market housing after 15 years or would it stay subject to that deed restriction? It'd be subject to the deed restriction. Okay. Um, typically those are um, for all ex successors and assigns, you know, okay. forever yeah. and forever. Amen. So um, there's no way to clear that off. There are ways. Um, and, you know, federally, uh, you have a mandatory 30 year period, mm -hmm. but states, the feds gave the states full discretion to go for longer if they want. In, mm -hmm. in Utah, for example, they typically have a 99 year <clears throat> affordability period. Um, in Idaho, that's around, it's typically been around 45 years. Um, okay. And those are scoring criterion or criterion in the singular. That's a scoring criterion that IHFA has. Um, One of your. Yeah. Um, and so if you elect to go beyond that, that's um, better, right? If you more say, points. I'm going to do 99 years. Yeah. 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 And, and, and in some cases, you kind of have to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, to your question of how you get rid of that, there are um, two main mechanisms. Well, there's three mechanisms, right? The first is time, right? Which we all understand. The second is foreclosure. Um, and the, uh, I think Congress, the intent behind that was, is could you imagine as a lender giving money to a project that has rent and income restrictions and what that does to your security interest? Mm -hmm. And so Congress, I think, wisely said, well, if this property goes south, we at least want those restrictions to go yeah. away yeah. so that the lenders so we can, make can recoup you know, their investment on the loan. Yeah. Um, and so that's one mechanism. The interesting caveat is to that is of all I'd say, and I just, you can look it up, but my understanding is of pretty much all multifamily apartment classes, um, affordable housing has like the lowest foreclosure rate. Mm. Um, it's typically the models working. It's typically under you know three percent. I would mm. think nationally. Um, and that might be you know that three percent might be severe mismanagement or who knows I mean, maybe yeah. because the projects are vetted so thoroughly on the front end to well qualify. You, yeah and you could imagine where like if you have a community where it has like one or two major employers yeah. and they leave and you know, coal mine in kentucky yeah. or yeah yeah so you could imagine scenarios like that where you don't foresee you Anaconda. know Anaconda. Mm -hmm. when the mine closes yeah maybe yeah um and then the third one is 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 kind of going away um, in the sense that a lot of states are asking owners and sponsors to waive the right to it, but it's called a qualified contract. And so for whatever reason, when the early amendments were done to the program, because when the program first started, it was only 15 years. And okay. then in the first three years, they added the second 15 year period <laughs> um, to the deed restrictions. Mm -hmm. But maybe it was a compromise, but with that second 15 year period, when it was introduced, 
they introduce this third concept called the qualified contract. And so basically an owner will go to a state agency and ask the state agency to be serve as the broker. Find me a buyer. I want out. Mm -hmm. um, and the state has a one-year period to do so. Um, they collect a bunch of diligence from a, a, a sponsor or operator, mm -hmm. and they basically get a marketing package together, and then they put it on their website. And, or they might use a third party. Mm -hmm. um, they might use a third party to market it for them. And so they have a one-year period to find a buyer. Now, it's not just at fair market value. Um, it's at a predetermined price, which is basically cost basis um, less... Um, I think it's less the distributions that have been made. So it's almost like a cost basis, yeah. less depreciation, but not quite. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a formula that's basically cost basis. And in a lot of markets, the cost basis on these apartments is not, con it's not comparable with the income basis. So you could have, you know, three, $4 million difference. Um, mm. The replacement costs on these assets are usually a lot higher um, than its income based approach to value. Okay. Um, not always, not yeah. always. Um, in some markets where cap rates are really low, um, you could imagine where, you know, they might be the same. Um, yeah. And that's another interesting side note we could get into because, uh, you know, generally speaking, I think, and you guys know this, I think, better than me because my life has only been pretty much focused on the affordable space. Um, market rate cap rates are probably what right now, probably 4%, 5%. Oh, they're hovering around 5 a little higher yeah. than 5 yeah, so depending on the asset. My experience is affordable has tended to trade two to three percent higher than sort of where market rates going, mm -hmm. um, but it's kind of deal specific because you have different area median incomes. Those are calculated on a county level, typically. So, you know, but yeah, generally speaking, and it depends on the type of transaction too. Um, well, I don't see much come up for sale around here. I've never seen one yet that I know of. It's been marketed for sale. Do you see them regularly? <laughs> At least I don't feel like they're presented to the brokerage community. Obviously, it sounds like yeah, um, we wouldn't have the buyers in hand anyhow. I'm trying to think of what the last like main ones that I've been involved with or seen that have come up in the Treasure Valley. And a lot of them, for a long time, I think off, a lot of them end up going off market. Um, mm -hmm. I saw one approved. I think yeah. Caleb had one approved last night at City Council down there Yeah, by the home path. or. Uh-huh. Yep. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. You were you were talking about like new development, yeah. or you were talking about sale? Well, okay. no sale. Like anything sale. I, I just saw the okay. new one come out. That's coming up, but I don't yeah. see many for sale. Well, part of the challenge is is that you know if you develop it, you're getting investors in, and they're underwriting you as the sponsor, and so it's really hard to get them to these investors to agree to you exiting yeah. because they want to stay in it. So usually the sales that do happen are after the year 15 yeah. okay. event. Yeah. And, and those are the ones you've acquired. Yeah. So I've acquired, um, two and I'm, I'm fingers crossed set to close on another project in uh, Laramie that I'm acquiring with some partners next week. Um, so those were all post uh, year 15 deals. Um, the other ones that are still in their credit delivery period are called, you know, GP interest transactions. And they basically underwrite you to step into an existing body of documents. And yeah. the buying pool on those are even smaller. Oh, um, yeah. You know. Because why are they leaving in the first place? That's, yeah. That's the question, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah. It's interesting. It sounds like a lot of understanding of policy. Yeah. A lot of grasping of code, yeah, um, and then a lot of networking to know the kind of people mm -hmm. that are interacting in this space. So it's a pretty diverse, yeah, skill set that yeah. I would say to to work effectively in these areas. But we've seen the the names that you've mentioned mm -hmm. have obviously had success, yeah, in this area, helping shape our area too, and helping shape yeah. the valley with some other projects outside of Litech. So yeah, definitely. So what's your, what is your future goal then? Oh, I, that's a good question. You know, right now, um, I'm looking at opportunities to acquire assets. Um, you know, but those are, those, those don't happen all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, but there are some that come up, um, in terms of brokers that get them. Um, there's usually, 
it's usually the big firms that you know get the brokerage because they have typically have an affordable arm just mm-hmm. because of the complexities involved you know the broker want you would want as a seller a broker that's going to have as close if not maybe even better knowledge of these programs yeah. than you in order to market the assets uh, and so they're typically firms like Bercadia has a brokerage outfit uh, Marcus and Millichap um, you know, those big national firms tend mm-hmm. to be the ones that get those. Um, and they have a pretty deep bench in terms of potential buyers mm-hmm. that they, they can work with. Um, but well, yeah, yeah. If it's that niche, like you say, yeah. it is, like I'm sure that it's not hard to, to put your buyers list together across the nation. Yeah. And I mean, as a seller, you know, you want to know that if you have a buyer, you want to know that it's someone that can get debt because right now that's probably the biggest unknown facing, yeah. you know, the, the markets right now. And then you also need to have someone that can get approved to work with in the case of Idaho IHFA, you mm-hmm. know, so they have consent rights mm-hmm. because of the deed restriction to any sales. So you have to also be you know an organization that's in good standing yeah. with them and i think rightfully so um all of these deed restrictions have public enforcement provisions yeah. you know and so if if you discovered that one of them's not being operated according to the deed restrictions you as a citizen could you know enforce that deed restriction and go seek an injunction you know mm. at a court um so so i i get why the consent rights are in there and i think that's a great thing um now the other part of your question is what am I working on? Yeah, um, yeah I want to acquire um, good assets when they come up that meet, you know, sort of my principal values that I have, which is, you know, I want it to be a strong operating property. I want it to be a property that allows for reinvestment in it. You know, I want to serve the community that's there. Um, and then I want it to be in the geographical footprint that I've set out, which for me, it's the inner mountain West. So it's Idaho and nevada utah wyoming um and montana possibly colorado is a state that i'm looking at but um so there's the acquisition part of of my plan and then eventually i want to get back into the ground up development um it's just really tough right now um for someone in my position to want to do that um maybe i'm a little too risk adverse at the moment with construction cost uncertainty and, mm-hmm. and forward rates on, on perm debt. But I'm kind of been sitting on the sidelines a little bit um, and kind of watching and waiting what, what takes place. Yeah. Um, That's been the word of t- late 2022 and early 2023 yeah. is pause. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Especially in terms of debt. Yeah. So, you know, I, I was telling Taylor before we started, I have a couple projects that I'm set, you know, we're set to possibly acquire that I'm looking at as a possible sort of acquisition rehab play. Um, Mm -hmm. But I have to sort of work through that with um, the IHFAs of the world, the Montana boards of the housing of the world, because I want to get their blessing and make sure that they're on board, that it's a needed thing, you know, but I do have a couple sites that I've identified as possibilities there. Um, And so that might be something that's on the table um, for this year, do a, substantial rehab and you know kind of really update a lot of the amenities and yeah. you know in unit amenities and exterior fun, um, roof and siding and that kind of thing parking mm-hmm. lots um so that's yeah that's kind of the uh that's kind of the plan um that's good what about and we ask every guest this but what's your outlook for the affordable aspect of the real estate market going forward yeah, um, that's a good question because um, that's actually a question I was even contemplating asking you guys because I know you guys talk with a lot of people, um, a lot of different people uh, and come into contact with folks that I don't necessarily come into contact with. Um, if I was to talk about the affordable space in general, I think things are, are, are good there. Um, you know, I, IHFA and, and the other states are still getting their tax credit resources. Mm-hmm. Deals are still getting funded. But, you know, it's been a real struggle for those that have gotten awards. They've had to go back to IHFA and have to have had to come up with some creative solutions. Mm -hmm. Um, And the other thing is, as someone that hasn't participated this year, but as a sort of fly on the wall, I'm really intrigued to see what takes place with the IHFA Workforce Housing Fund that was passed in the last 12 months. I just got an email about that today. Yeah. And I believe they're having a second round. Um, in it's like the first week of March. Yeah. 
Yep. And you have to have your decision by then or your property by then. Yeah, and mm -hmm. that's been really interesting. Um, and again, not getting into politics, but that barely passed in the state legislature um, when it was approved. Um, I think it was approved in 2021, but I could be off on the date. I think it was approved by like one vote. Oh. And, and so they gave the $50 million that the state got from ARPA, I believe, um, and they tasked it to IHFA to apply for workforce housing. And I do, did not envy the, the, the good folks over at IHFA because they had to try their best to make legislative intent, but also wow. comply with the federal requirements mm -hmm. of the ARPA money. And, and, and kind of talking about a jigsaw puzzle there, they, they, they've had a hard task with that. And to have that all happen in the midst of massive growth in Idaho coupled with inflation and, and all mm -hmm. kinds of challenges mm -hmm. in the interest rate environment. It's, it, I can't imagine it's been easy. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of the applications that they received in October, maybe half of them were for existing projects. I could be wrong on that. Um, so those were ones that were either in the midst of construction or I believe hadn't quite closed yet. Um, and needed gap financing because okay. of cost overruns and the inflation or the interest rate run up mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that we've seen. And so I think fortunately that resource came out at a, at a good moment for those deals to save them. Um, but some of them I believe are new, are new construction deals that hadn't been you know in the pipeline already. Um, and I think they allocated about half of the money in October. Okay. And so that's why I think they're having a second round. And would that be implemented the same as the um, a light tech deal or are those implemented differently? Yeah, it's implemented differently. They're allowing you to couple it with the 4% credit that I alluded to, uh -huh. but didn't go into a ton of detail on. Um, so those, that 4% credit, it has to be coupled with a tax exempt, uh, private facility bond. Um, okay. and so if, if you do, if you go for the 4% credit, um, for new construction, you have to use private activity taxes on bonds okay um and get a bond issuer and you have to follow tefra notices and all of that um and that just adds a layer you know of complexity to your deal totally um, adds another position in house that you have to <laughs> hire somebody to be your strategist yeah your the, attorneys yeah. Are, the attorneys are liking these deals yeah oh yeah, yeah. oh yeah um so yeah, um, you know, but to directly answer your question i think the affordable assets will weather the storm um you know, it's obviously we're seeing some price deflation, I think, on mm -hmm. the stuff that's, you know, mm -hmm. is listed and is for sale um, because of the interest rate environment. Right. Um, but we're not going to deal with the the rent concerns, I think, that you might get in your yeah. class B, class A luxury type stuff where, you know, if you've been pushing rents for 10 to 20 percent year over year, yeah. we don't really have that you know, at play because our rents are kind of determined based on incomes mm -hmm. and the data is lagging. So actually, I don't even know if um, that'll be interesting to see how the the income limits roll out in the next couple of years right. um, um, as, as our program, I think is a little bit, you know, behind. Yeah. Um, but I, I feel strongly about the asset class, given the history um, and having, ha having the assets that they, you know, they don't deal with the foreclosure events very often. Um, you, you aren't competing, you know, as much in terms of market rent. Mm -hmm. right. Um, and typically the assets have, you know, long waiting lists and yeah. that kind of thing. So I, I feel pretty good about it. Um, the, the, thing i don't feel great about is the production side mm -hmm. you new know one, new projects coming online you, yeah i you know and the program is always going to be supply constraint because you start out with a finite resource mm -hmm. and they, they caught unfortunately the deals cost more money to do sometimes because they are more complex sorry to take mm -hmm. a jab at the attorneys but <laughs> um, you know you have more it's complicated true. you know deal structures so they tend to cost a little more and so you have a fixed supply and with cost unknowns, um, with interest rate unknowns, you know, I'm concerned for the production. You know, mm -hmm. a state like Idaho typically is generating, and my number might be off, but I think they're typically generating only about 500 units a year um, that, that's being produced in this program. Yeah, which is, and we've had so much growth. Yeah. There's no way to keep yeah, I call it that home, but it's, it's New Path, that New mm -hmm. Path project. The, yeah. The planning and zoning board mm -hmm. was like, this is a no-brainer. 
Yeah. And, uh, we're, we're here. Well, I don't yeah. know why we're talking about this. This is a, this is a good vote. Idaho needs it. We need it. There's mm -hmm. not enough of it going around. So yeah. And I didn't, I didn't add up the unit count from the October round that they had for the workforce housing fund. I, if I remember correctly, I think they wanted to produce about another thousand units, but mm -hmm. I, I could be wrong. Okay. Um, and so, but I mean, there's a shortage. I mean, Boise alone needs that many units, right, you know, yeah. and then you start talking about the Meridians and Nampas and Caldwell's right. of the world. And Yeah, when you think about workforce housing, there's a lot of towns like McCall, mm -hmm. Sun Valley, Griggs, yeah. right? Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure it's true of you, for you guys. I, I have a friend, you know, I have friends that I know that live in McCall that are either teachers or... Yep. You know, hospital work, workers, hospital mm -hmm. workers, or they work at the sheriff's office, and and they're living in our, our, an RV, right, you know, yeah. and you know, or they're an making, Airbnb, yeah, or they're make they're making the most of it, but is it <laughs> an ideal situation? Probably not. No, right? Yeah, that's interesting. Well, thank you for coming on yeah. today. And so, if people wanted to reach you for any reason to get a hold of you, what what's their best? Uh, probably LinkedIn. Um, okay. Just Corey Checkets on there. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, that's good. It's been a pleasure having yeah, you today, absolutely. and thanks for blowing our mind. And <laughs> yeah, I feel like we've scratched the surface. I know, and we need to re, you know, have you back on the show. And I feel like this is lesson one of like yeah, an eight series. We've explored one it's, silo barely. Yeah, yeah, I had a I had a guy working when when, when I was still at CTI. We had a guy working for us uh, who was we reported to me, and I'd I'd tell him it's like drinking from a fire hydrant. Yeah. yeah you know, well, I'm happy just, that uh, God put you in that position because it sounds like if you're still doing it, you're the right guy for the job. I appreciate you that saying that. That scared away yeah. a lot of people in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for tuning in, and we hope to see you at the next time. And check us out on LinkedIn, Instagram, YouTube, yeah, Facebook. You, major podcasting all those cool platforms. Places. We're there. And go play with ChatGPT. <laughs> We're not. <laughs> <laughs> We're done.